The desire to be nothing. Maybe you know what I mean when I say that sometimes it would be nice to just disappear. This desire to merge with the stars in the night sky and silently dissolve. I am sure billions have experienced this before, but it is difficult to talk about openly. In our society, an expression of this desire gets easily confused with self-destructive tendencies and fantasies about one's own violent death. Although this might be a serious consideration for some, this is not what I mean. I've learned to appreciate my existence over time. I also recognize the immense burden that life is. Nobody has asked to be born, and depending on your outlook, life might seem more like a curse than a gift. Looking down from a height, the possibility of non-existence feels real. Seeing how easy it would be to fall and make everything disappear is quite astonishing. Or being at a train station and hearing the train speeding towards you. One can almost touch oblivion. Mixed with fear and intrigue. Wondering what would happen and then wondering why one just thought about that. These experiences are much more common than we make them out to be. Not because we are in danger to ourselves, but as an expression of the human condition. A hidden, deep longing to be nothing. Painless, peaceful and free. It is funny to notice that any concept of nothing kind of misses the point. How could I want to be nothing if this isn't anything at all? Is nothingness even possible? I've had a long journey behind me before I found answers to these questions. This is what I want to share. As a kid I was hyper obsessed about existential questions. Why does anything exist at all? And why do others not care as much about the answer as I do? I grew up in a religious household, so God usually was the answer for everything. You wonder how it is like to be an adult and know it all, until you grow older and realize that all adults are as lost as children. They're just bad at pretending. I too believed in God growing up, until I questioned the ideas through facts and logic, and so I lost my faith. I was around 14 years old at the time. It became so clear that no omniscient, all-loving, all-powerful God would have created a world like this one. I found great comfort in the scientific and secular communities online. I loved watching The Atheist Experience and other channels that were very popular in this age of YouTube, like Matt Dillahunty, Jacqueline Glenn, The Amazing Atheist, Thunderfoot. Not only did I realize that the existence of God as proposed in the Bible is self-contradictory, it also became clear that if he did exist in the way described, he would be evil. I finally found truth that I could rely on. I leveled up my worldview. Science was awesome and I loved its principled approach. As good as science was in explaining physical phenomena in the material world, philosophy became a rabbit hole way deeper than I thought it would. I desperately wanted to find some objective absolute truth. Some sense of meaning that didn't rely on human subjectivity. I deconstructed everything and ended up with nothing. Only an infinite void, echoing a deep sense of loneliness. Longing for a higher purpose that didn't exist. Time kills everything you think matters and no one cares. I was sure there was no other way to look at reality. I felt intellectually superior in that I finally saw how the world truly was. It didn't make me happy, but at least it was true, I thought. Rick and Morty was the best thing ever at that time, encapsulating this nihilism in the most creative, multi-dimensional fever dream I could have ever wished for. What about the reality we left behind? What about the reality where Hitler cured cancer, Morty? The answer is don't think about it. When we saw Rick, we could empathize with his lack of care for existence. In a world of infinite possibilities, the individual appears worthless, infinitely small, lacking any importance in comparison to the infinite. It was easy to look at nihilism as the only possible answer. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV. It is hard to describe how much these words meant to me at that time. As the show went on, it pointed out a weird paradox in nihilism. You did care about these specific individuals in the show. Rick himself cared. The attachments that Rick had was what gave the show its heart. And ironically, was also what Rick hated about himself. Rick was like a failed nihilist. He desperately wanted to not care about anything in order to protect himself from the galactical burden that his existence meant. Nihilism becomes a defense mechanism. There's either way too much to care about or nothing to care about at all. As I grew older, I figured out that I do care. If I'm having an experience and I want it to be pleasant, then there has to be some core truth here that makes things actually matter. 
hand waving away all of human experience just like this seemed at odds with my inherent desire for happiness and well-being for myself and others. The movie Everything Everywhere All at Once makes this point beautifully. It has this wacky over-the-top creativity I loved from Rick and Morty, and in a way it's the climax of years of interdimensional travel put into one singular movie. It reveals how when you follow nihilism to its logical end, it destroys itself. Nihilism has to be then meaningless too. Nothing matters becomes equal to everything matters. Sensations are real. In our deepest self, we share the same desire. To love and to be loved. It's the inherent meaning we feel when connecting with others and being appreciated for who we are. When you experience something you love, it doesn't matter if there are other 8 billion people or 20 different multiverses. When you have something to care for, be it families, friends or passions, there's no need for philosophical deconstruction. It is like a father holding his newborn in his hands asking himself if he really should care now. As positive as this might sound, there's a dark truth hiding here, the one that we were trying to avoid in the first place through nihilism. If love is intrinsically meaningful, then so is fear. Neon Genesis Evangelion is a highly influential anime series from the mid-90s. The plot is set in a post-apocalyptic world where beings called angels have destroyed half the human population. The story follows Shinji, a 14-year-old boy who is recruited by his father to pilot giant biomechanical suits in order to combat these angels. If you haven't seen Evangelion before, it's about to get weird. Through this surreal context, the show creates a dive into the human psyche, exploring themes like depression, loneliness and existentialism. Each character in the show is grappling with a profound sense of loneliness and the inherent fear of intimacy. Shinji is fueled by a sense of worthlessness and self-doubt, looking for approval from everyone around him. The character Asuka uses her brash personality to avoid appearing vulnerable or weak. She fears being seen as insufficient, so she pushes others away with anger before they can. And the character Rei is called Stoic. Not understanding her place in existence, she seems incapable to form any real emotional connection. Together they act as a mirror for their own lack of self-acceptance. Because all desire to form connections with others requires to confront the fear of rejection. In all aspects in life, you can always observe the polarity between love and fear, attraction and rejection. We desire something and we pursue it, and we fear something and we run away from it. In a certain way, love is kind of a magnetic pole, and it either rejects you or it moves you towards it. In order to alleviate this deep sense of loneliness, each character would have to open up and make themselves even more vulnerable, but instead they push each other further away. The conundrum here, between love and fear, is that to be understood is to be judged by another. Connection requires giving up a part of yourself, and therefore is inherently painful. A part of us needs to surrender control to the image that the other creates of us. The self wants to control reality and make everything happen to its wish, and when it doesn't align to the will of the self, we suffer. The desire to be nothing can be understood as the need for eternal peace from the self, not having an image anymore to protect or pursue giving up all sense of control, because in this imaginary space of nothingness, it would equate to complete freedom. In the final act, Evangelion becomes increasingly self-reflective and surreal, presenting the climax of all of these themes. A secret organization named Seele, which means soul in German, believes that the root of all human suffering lies in our individuality. Through a surreal angelic ritual, the organization destroys all egos dissolving the boundaries that separated each individual from another, melding all human consciousness into one singular entity. This means the death of humanity as we know it, as all beings merge into one. Zele believes that in this state of shared consciousness and absence of sense of self, humanity will achieve a state of perfect understanding and unity, free from the pain of individual existence. If you've watched Evangelion, you know how weirdly relatable it is, you kind of don't really get what is going on through the later half of the movie, but somehow you feel it very much speaks to you on a deep level you can't really describe. The abstract symbolism of Evangelion represents very profound spiritual concepts found in various religious and philosophical systems. In Hinduism it is the idea of God being everything, the collective experience of every being merged into one. In Buddhism it is the idea of emptiness, 
that no individual is experiencing reality, but reality is experiencing itself. In the spiritual tradition, this state of being is usually referred to as enlightenment. Both point to a state of being where all is interconnected. In a way, it is the ultimate expression of love, because it means complete unity and the lack of self. At the end of Evangelion, our protagonist Shinji is the representation of nothingness. He finds himself with boundless power, being completely free from all limits. But he finds himself afraid. He realizes that without an other, he himself starts to disappear. There's boundless freedom but nothing to share it with. Nothing makes any sense without the image of an other reflecting back one's own identity. So one step after another, reality recreates itself. Distinctions get to know each other again, by moving, transforming and shifting shape. It shows how as long as there are distinctions, we can never be completely free. But with complete freedom, we can't be anything at all. We wish for love, but fear its pain. We long for transcendence, but want to remain in our shape. We desire to be nothing, while not wanting to die. But aside of being a trippy concept to talk about, it is actually possible to have non-dual experiences. They are often interpreted as mystical or a sense of dying. They are common in psychedelics, near-death experiences or even advanced meditation states. Many people have reported experiencing some sort of non-dual awareness. They describe how they cease to exist and enter an indescribable sense of unity or nothingness. They describe how in this state there was still an experience present but just no sense of I or individual ego who was experiencing it. In psychedelic communities this is often referred to as ego death or absent selfhood. This experience can be life transforming for many who have gone through it but it also puts a lot of stuff into question if you take all of these ideas seriously. Because in a way, you experiencing reality right here, right now, are eternal evidence that absolute nothingness is impossible. Because for absolute nothingness to be possible, this moment you are experiencing right now could not be happening. It's kind of an absolute fact of the universe that you are alive right now. And it can never be undone. So existence has to be permanently real. Then I would argue what it means is that there is no real death the way we imagine it. That nothingness as a concept is completely impossible. It could be the case that consciousness is what the universe is made out of. And we are just experiencing a tiny part of this infinity. But this is the separation that our ego has. This is why we are scared of death so much. Because it is the elimination of our boundaries with everything else. And then we start merging into infinity again. We like to think that our own sense of self is almost like the entire reality, but we know for a fact that it doesn't make sense. When we empathize with other beings, we recognize a part of ourselves in them, as if we understand on a very profound level that we are them in a weird way. Because when somebody is suffering, it is kind of as if the universe is suffering, or if reality itself is suffering and you just want to help it, you just want to do something about it. And it might be the case that this is connecting us to our true nature, an immortal, divine, endless, infinite being. To see the ultimate truth underlying our reality, we might have to drop very fundamental assumptions we hold of our life and death, and look where we haven't been comfortable to look seriously. It seems very clear to me that our desire for nothingness has a deep root in wanting to find out our true nature, exploring what it means to look beyond our small identities into the endless and infinite. Our well-being matters, and clearly we as a species haven't figured this part out yet. I'm sure that taking our conscious experience seriously and diving deeper into what this desire for nothingness is all about seems like an amazing way to start. If you've resonated with this video and you currently feel stuck or lost in life, I believe I can help you. I'm currently providing a free one-on-one -on -one coaching program. In a span of three weeks, I want to teach you everything that I have learned via video chat, what has made me able to find a purpose and a vision for my life. I want this to be a personalized experience, so I really want to get to know you and understand your model of the world and what you're struggling with, so that together we can map a vision for your future self, to live a life that is actually fun and fulfilling to live. I speak English, Spanish and German, so if English isn't uh, yeah, like your native language, Spanish and German is also perfectly fine for me. So if this sounds interesting, click on the link in the description below and fill the application. I'm limiting this to five people at a time, since it's going to be one-on-one -on -one contact 
and I want to provide actually a quality service, uh, I have to limit it like that. I will basically take in five people every three weeks. To give even a bit more of context than this entire video has provided, I used to be very addicted to weed, YouTube, and video games, but especially weed. A really key component too that came on top of all of this were some crazy psychedelic experiences that left me even more confused and scarred about the meaning of life. And I wished so much I had somebody who could guide me through this because I, like, I really was feeling like I was losing my mind. Now I kind of want to provide help for others who might also struggle with addiction or like some um, weird trauma. And you might ask yourself, why am I doing this for free? And to be completely honest, it's also a learning opportunity for me because I want to learn how to um, coach online. I have coached friends before and gave them some good results, but doing this like in a more formal, in quotation marks, setting is of course different. And I want to be sure that what I provide is really helping others. So I'm also looking for authentic feedback. Finding life purpose is kind of like a journey inward. It is mm, a lot of the times the ability to understand yourself, question yourself, and then let go of addictive behaviors. And I'm very sure I can help you with that. So yeah, if you're interested, click on the link in the description below. Um, it's limited to five people only, so I'd apply as quickly as you can. If not, the queue might get too long. I'd love to talk to you. Peace among worlds.